you just can't get rid of a bomb. Hey, it's Will. And this is Thomas. And we're back at the virtual spinner rack once again for the second part of our Seeds of Destruction celebration to Hellboy's 30th anniversary. But first, it's the pre-show. And then, in between, we'll take a look at a book that's now funding on Indiegogo from uh, artist Joe Catapano called Star Circuit 2. Yes, there was already a Star Circuit 1. That was the first book. Oh. But we'll take a look at that in a little while. Uh, so did you get any cool stuff this week? Uh, the only thing I got this week is uh, my youngin was uh, walking down the clearance aisles at Walmart and asked me what I wanted. And I said, give me that gung ho for nine bucks. Yo, Joe. Dude, these are so cool. I just remember when we were little, they were only like half the size. Yeah. But he comes with all the figures and everything. $9. Nice. Yes. Um, they had uh, Lady J and Destro, but I didn't really like the way they look. I like Gung Ho. So add that to my ever slowly growing collection of damn G.I. Joe figures from the past. Uh, I think I had. I had a roadblock, and I had the, I had the motorcycle with the Gatling gun sidecar. That's all I ever bought. Really? I bought that at like the the end of the the run. Like my comic shop had like a couple of Joe things because he used to he used to work at Hasbro. Him and all his friends used to work at Hasbro, yeah. and uh, a bunch of the Hasbro design team used to show up to the shop to like buy books if they were looking for like a certain character they were working a new line on. They would get a bunch of books so they have like you know, fresh reference material. Uh, and that's how I met Bart Sears. Oh, really? Dude, that's somebody that's not doesn't draw anymore on comics. That's, um, that's a shame. Once in a great, once in a great while, I, I'm not sure what happened. He might've gotten sick. Um, and I think, I think a lot of it was just, um, he would put so much detail in his work that uh, deadlines were poison to him. So, yeah. kind of like Joe Casada, but when Joe Casada was uh, editor in chief, nobody would yell at him for it. They would just say, "Just get the book out." Yeah, like Casada was amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like that. The only thing I kept, like from his daredevil one was like i think i kept like three copies of like the first issue just because that cover was just so badass yeah yeah i mean that and that story was amazing that story brought daredevil back yeah um did you not keep uh sword of Azrael? in daredevil no in batman oh the batman stuff i kept yeah yeah yeah, because he did Batman Sword of Azrael too. Oh, yeah, man, it was good. I I, I should have known that because all those books were like late by like a month, month and a half all the time. Damn it. Damn it. Um. So I only got two things. One of which I one of which I sent you a picture of uh, that looks looks much better in person. As we know, I'm a big uh, JML fan, Joe Michael Linsler. Yeah. Gone and damn it let's put let's push as many sex tropes as we can in one cover i'm like she dances someplace that's all i know um she so someplace. this is independent voices issue two um and this book benefits the comic book legal defense fund 
Oh, sweet. Um, back when it came out in the 90s. Uh, September of 99, to be exact. Um, Damn. But in black and white, there are authors' names and book names that have been banned. Really? Um, so this lovely, lovely young lady that's making her way down a rocket pop uh, in her in her uh, book strap, because she's got a belt around three novels of uh, Romeo and Juliet, Huckleberry Finn, and Catcher in the Rock. All three are great books. Oh, yeah. Um, so I bought it for the cover because I always wanted that. And then somebody talked me out of it one day at the, at the shop and said, you know, he only did the cover. He didn't do any of the inside. It's all black and white. That's what. That's why all he does now. Yeah, he's 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 the cover boy for Dynamite, but he's doing like one cover for every title. So the more titles yeah. they have, the more he gets paid. <laughs> and he's working on. I don't know if he's doing the art for it, but obviously he did the cover. Uh, there's a new Vampirella series, like mini series, launching. So. Oh really. I didn't see that one. Uh, this is Let Your Imagination Wander with uh, Peregrine Entertainment. It's just like a full page fat cover ad. God, I don't remember any of these people. So uh, the cover by JML. Um, then this first one, which the art is amazing, is Books of Lore. Evil's Pawn by David uh, Napoleo, uh, Kevin Tucker, and Phil Harvier. And there's uh, two. There's like eight story, eight short stories in here. Good God, how thick is the damn book? So it's regular size. So it's eight short stories. And it's it's over forty pages. Yeah. Oh, okay. So each story is five pages or so. But I mean. Oh yeah, the arts. Typical late eighty, uh, late nineties. Yeah. Late nineties. Uh, you know, really good looking, like line art and. Oh yeah, werewolf looks cool. Great monsters. A lot of it's like silly looking, but. Come on. Um, podcast. Take you to the Chinese restaurant. Stop it. Probably too too old and uh, hard. This is like, you know, a little cartoony. It still looks good. You know, it's still it's still good line work. This one's called Boondoggle. It's very wordy and looks like a hipster version of Doonberry. <laughs> I like Doonesbury now. Hipster's version of Doonesbury. Uh, and they're making they're making fun of uh, the Phantom Menace at the end of the book, at the end of that story, which is kind of funny. Oh my God. <laughs> the next one's called Buzz Boy. Um, they're like laying out, they're laying out like all the, all the TV news panels, like the dark night. Really? Yeah. Hey, Alan, welcome. It doesn't take up like the whole page. It's just like, you know, like the row there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Up at the top. Yeah. Yeah, they're not doing the Frank Miller thing. Speaking no, of the Dark Knight, have you looked into the Avengers Twilight series that's coming out? No. They're saying it's supposed to be Marvel's version of, you know, Dark Knight Returns, but for the Avengers. I was reading a big article on it. They've been working on it for five years. 
kind of like an alternate history, future, I don't know. It kind of got my, it piqued my interest when I heard, heard that. I was like, really? Uh, this is a very short story called Bottom Feeders Shouldn't Get Cocky. Done by the creator of The Goon, Eric Powell. Really? That may be worth money. I got his new... Um, and that's 20. why. <laughs> He gets munched on. Um, I got his uh, new Goon 25th anniversary or something comic mm -hmm. that just come out, The Dark Horse. Oh, you know what would be impressive? If the Goon movie ever came out. Have they been working on one? They were supposedly working on one like, for like the last 20 years. But Oh, my God. Then there is a story <clears throat> pencils by Rich Hen, uh, a story called uh, what? Herschel the Rat. Looks kind of like Mickey on meth. <laughs> Mickey on meth. Who's your Yeah, he wants to go back outside. And that art isn't, that art is typical like indie comics art from the day, from like the 80s. So is this next one by Ava Hopkins with art by the the Philbot brothers called Fear of Flight. Huh. And I think Yeah, that's that's the last last story. That's the last story. Oh, cool. Then it's, then it's got the fight censorship. Uh, and back in 99, you could actually buy the T-shirt with the Lindner cover on it. Oh, sweet. And then I wonder there's... if you can get you one on eBay. Probably. I don't think they'll fit either of us now. Uh, and then there's a contributors page. So it's got like a little write-up on everybody that did something in the book. Yeah. And... Brown chicken, wow, wow. If you thought that was sexy, how about a 12 inch Magic Mike Hulk? <laughs> That's the only clothes he's got. So That's the only clothes was left. I posted, I posted in a couple of the Migo groups and uh, tried to tag uh, Dr. Migo because he, he makes all the stuff for these. Yeah. <laughs> it's for Rigno ass. <laughs> I mean, I would literally take this and have Lou sign his back. Yeah. I'm not going to have him sign his cheek. But, uh... At least you know his ass isn't broken. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have a crack in it. <laughs> just a crease. Just a crease. <laughs> you know. Terrible. Terrible old, old people jokes. Oh, a little bit of a crease. So what's our book again today? Uh, the uh, the crowdfunder is Star Circuit Chapter 2, Synchronicity. It's a uh, futuristic cyberpunk, uh, very reminiscent of... Uh, Blade Runner, and yes, uh, there's a lot of motorcycle racing going on. Yeah, Japanation too. Yep, this is an American guy from Florida. Uh, his goal, his fixed goal is 9K. He's got 117 backers, 21 days to go. He's at 66. He's at 66, 68, so he's 74% of goal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after after basically like a week so oh he'll make it oh yeah let's take a 
launch trailer. Welcome to Colony A.2.1. Here, a vast network connects the minds of each member of the populace, delivering endless entertainment. Augmentally custom made for each individual member free of charge. It's the cornerstone of modern life, a perfect system. That was until a street racer named Atlas Metric caused a glitch in this flawless system. It went undetected by the system admins, but now has the attention of a nefarious power who will do whatever it takes to retrieve the cause of the glitch. Atlas, now relentless android assassins have been dispatched to capture him. In order to escape this threat, he will need to overcome the impossible with the glitch in tow. But hey, impossible is just something losers say when they've given up, right? Okay, that art is badass. Yes. He's that art is good. badass. That, that's good. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I love cyber, cyberpunk stuff. But that that's amazing ass art. Especially for an indie comic. He write the story as well? Yep. So he's kind of got creative control over the whole thing. Exactly. Um he does he does the all the Pencils and Marcos Martins is doing the colors. And it just looks awesome. It's freaking awesome, yeah. How much is it? $40? Uh, $40 is the featured tier, which gets you book one and two. Yeah, if I was going to buy one, I, that's definitely the one I'd get. Because I've, I've not read book one. Uh, you can get the PDF. Uh one and two for uh, 15 15 dollars yeah i'm gonna I'll, i'd spend the 40 dollars and get the art covers i'm gonna be like stanley you know boobs look great on paper but they're like <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we just saw some that looked great on paper but um they're much better in real life <laughs> yeah. star circuit channel two uh this cover is twenty eight dollars, and that's but now that's just the issue two. Yeah, that doesn't include the first book. Okay, no. Um, Star Circuit Channel Two. Uh, this is the variant cover, and then Synced, which is one ten. One copy of each cover of Star Circuit Chapter Two. One copy of Star Circuit Chapter One. Uh, one glitch, please. Hollow sticker, and one uh, kanji patch featuring the logo. One original sketch card drawn by Joe Catapano. Books are bagged and boarded and shipped in Gemini mailers. So you get. Uh, like the main seven copies. Six. No, no, you get the you get the main cover of number you get six things. You get the main cover of issue one. Uh you get the main cover of issue two plus the variant cover of issue two. Uh you get the hollow sticker, the patch, and an original art sketch card. Oh, sweet. For one ten, which you know is pretty good. Uh two fifty, you get original artwork. You get an original page, one copy of Star Circuit Two, and an original page from Chapter One. Original page is uh, drawn and signed by Joe Catapano. Pages can be viewed on Star Circuit Web Store and can be chosen first come first serve after the campaign completes. So basically, we will sell you a page of original art, and we will just give you the book for nothing. Yeah. Uh, that's limited to 15 pages. Uh, there's only 14 left. Uh, the yeah, cool. Rob Will Rob Willis is the one that did this, the variant cover yeah. with the ro robot androids. The original artwork, 
just the pencils for that. Uh, it's available, but it's eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, Joe's cover sold already. His cover was six hundred dollars. Yeah. And if you go to the campaign, uh, which is linked in the chat and in the, the video description, um, you can read a preview of chapter one by just clicking there. Oh, sweet. I'm and here's a, here's, a, here's a better view of, of the main cover that Joe did. How many pages is the book? Did it say? Uh, that's what I was looking for. 72 pages. Holy Jesus. So it's a big old book. Yeah. And this is the Rob Willis, uh, Robot variant. Cover. Yeah, the yeah. variant. And it, it's all like a Kara looking with like all the his blurred speed force and everything. Yeah. And uh, Rob Willis did, did that, and the colors were done by Alonzo Espinoza. Uh, product stat status as of right now, for about a week ago, uh, script is 100%, layouts are 100%, pencils are 71%, flats are 25%, and colors are 20%. So it's like 65% overall completed. Here's the mock-ups of what the books will look like. They're, you know, perfect square bound. Saddled, I think. No, not saddled. They're like, so it's basically going to be like getting like one of the Marvel or DC prestige books from the 90s that were square bound. Yeah, the big square bound, like Gotham by Gaslight. Yeah, stuff like that. Uh, the character, he's got, you know, info on the characters. Uh, Atlas Metric, who's the star of the show, affluent street racer, likes after parties himself. <laughs> uh, he's age 24, which is why he likes himself so much. Just give it a couple of years, Atlas. You'll hate yourself. Thank You'll hate you. yourself. Height 5'11", weight 173, LA, whatever that means. That's like cyberpunk weight. Uh, Minometric, uh, virtuous intellectual, likes history, memory rebuilds, uh, 25. So it's probably, that's his older brother, I guess. The love it interest, I guess, is hit Turan, hot tempered adrenaline junkie, likes anyone who can keep up. Well, all righty then. <laughs> uh, Nick DeRault. With some, you know, 1985 biker helmet on, uh, is a hopeless romantic inventor. Likes the girls next door in Data. Dang. Star Trek? Oh, maybe it's Data. Uh, Ed Sanosuke, legendary uh, circuit racer. Likes AR landscapes and. Things that are our routine. Uh, Rook is the prime android assassin. Likes nothing. Age unknown. Height 6'10. Weight 176 kilos. 6'10. He's an android. Oh, good goal. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and here's a look at some interior pages that just look insane. Yeah, the art is really nice. Get this guy over at DC. Get him drawing Batman Beyond. He's all about his creator-owned comics. Oh, I know. They'll make more money that way. Oh, yeah. And this is just like the breakdown. Uh, Star Circuit 2 will have 72-plus pages, so there'll be like some extra stuff in the back. Yeah, probably like uh, sketch designs or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
from the beginning one copy of Star Circuit. Two main cover, main cover for both issues of Star Circuit. One ten is the one with the sketch card and the uh, the patch and the sticker, original art. All available original pages can be viewed here, so you can just click there, and it'll uh, it'll it'll show you the pages that are available. So if you see one that you like, you can claim it. Yeah. Chapter two, twenty-eight dollars by itself. It's only Chapter, on Indiegogo. Currently, it's only on Indiegogo. It's going to be moved. He's going to be starting a uh, a fund my comic, and I think a Kickstarter at the same okay. time. Um, but he wants to get it funded on Indiegogo because you get it funded on Indiegogo, then you don't have to get funded on Kickstarter. You just have to offer a exclusive Kickstarter cover, yeah. and you can take your Indiegogo campaign edit it and transfer it directly to Kickstarter as an open open source. Oh, sweet. Like a store. Uh, and he's looking at fulfilling this. Uh, he thinks he's going to be able to uh, ship these out uh, by November. November. Yeah. Um, you get the hollow sticker with him on the bike with, you know, all the vibrant, you know, chrome colors. Glitch, please. Uh, it's a two by three reflective sticker is three dollars. Uh, get your book signed uh, for three bucks. That's you, it's a no brainer. Yeah. Um, you can get the kanji patch, which is just like the Star Circuit logo yeah. and with the Japanese lettering off to the side for two, yeah. a two, two dollars for a patch. Come on. And here's just some more original art. So there's that the art from that first cover. That's the cover, yeah. That's so nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Mobile Start. wallpaper. Mobile wallpaper at 10K. Colony map digital download at 20k. Thirty K is a mystery. Although on the first campaign, yeah. The biggest thing on there was a 3D rendering of the star of the show on his motorcycle. Oh, sweet. And you could you could either get it primed or painted. Painted, of course, was more, but Joe would paint it himself. Um, or you could just get it primed and you could paint it yourself. No, I'd, I'd have him do it because I suck at painting stuff like that. Uh, Star Circuit was created by me, Joe Catapano, more than five years ago. It's a story inspired by many early memories of F-Zero, Blade Runner, Akira, Outlaw Star, and later, Neuromancer. My artistic influences include uh, Japanese-American fusion styles, like from Joe Moderna and Alvin Lee, while designs stem from the work of the late futurist Sid Mead. Star Circuit is written and drawn by Joe Catapano, also colors for the full first chapter, and chapter two colors are going to be done by Marcos Martins. Uh, the variant cover for Chapter 2 is by Rob Willis with colors by Alonzo Espinoza. Chapter 2 has been edited by Julius Freeman, Kimo Sabi, and Piper. Uh, Kimo Sabi is a, an awesome comic book creator from uh, Down Under in the land of Vegemite. And Piper is a uh, somebody that I've gone on stream with many times before. She's awesome. Um, She's an editor and a writer. So uh, this book should turn out like awesome. The first one was so good. Hmm. Um, it came out so good. And it took him a little bit longer than he wanted to get it out because he was doing everything. Yeah. Literally everything by himself. So Sweet. But I figured we'd take a look at that. 
And uh, now, turn that pot. Alan's Kickstarter has been pushed back. Yeah, he bought a. Um, uh, they were doing a new comic book adaptation of Frankenstein and Dracula, and they pushed it back. Oh. Art was amazing. I signed up for a gaming Kickstarter today because I can't say no to the letters of POA. Planet of the Apes role-playing game. Really? That would be cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a few source books. One of the source books is for all the source material from all the movies and TV shows, including the cartoon, I think. God, I love the, uh, the TV shows. Yeah. Stosky and Hutch goes to the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Chapter 3. Hellboy, 30th yep. anniversary. Now, Here's your trivia for today because they thought they'd sneak something past me. This is the cover or the introduction, the break with trap between chapter three. All right, now I'm going to show you something because you saw it, so you know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now look at that. So. See this monster? Oh, yeah, that was the cover of chapter three. Right like there. A, vari a, a variation of it. Yep, there it is. I mean, you can even see, you know, the same dragons, all this. The reason I'm bringing this up, just because I was reading through it, and what happens when you spend five years in art school, you can recognize Albrecht Dürer whenever you see him. And okay. this is Albrecht Dürer, German high renaissance artist. He's used throughout the Dangum Hellboy book, the first one, like St. Michael destroying the dragon and all this. I was like, ah, they even got the uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse on there. But I was like, nice. Dang. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, now let's bring our book back. There's your trivia. So we know that uh, Mignola was looking at some uh, Renaissance art when he was doing his stuff. Uh, chapter three. All right, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do like how the, the book starts. The second, third part just starts after he got pulled into the damn, the bottom of the ground. And he, yeah. he's just reminiscing as he's falling. I look back on my career, the years of being the world's greatest paranormal expert. Seems I spent a lot of it off the ground, falling, leaping, <laughs> whatever. And then he <laughs> crashes into the water underneath the damn um the damn uh castle and the thing that's so cool to me on this little part is they never really talk about help hellboy's not stupid and he's like you know i hit the water um and the piece of my brain that's still working tells me i can't have fallen nearly as far as it seems the cabinet's house sits on a sallow spit of land rocking out in the lake it's almost the same level uh, it's almost the same level as the water. The lake is only a few dozen feet above sea level since no long, no water can be lower than sea level. Um, I can't have fallen more than 50 feet. So, I mean, it's just he's he's putting the stuff together as he's moving on. And that's the crap that you don't, I don't want to say you don't see in the movie. You just see him as the big guy that shoots shit. Uh, um, the palette in this book is so good and oh, yeah. it's the colors are so simple it's just huge blocks of color and black that's it it forms all the shadows and everything um but yeah so he lands in the water underneath the damn castle and starts moving and it's got dude you see all this freaking aztec stuff and everything around it yeah um but he's moving through and he's talking about he hears a familiar voice it says uh yeah, and it's Rasputin. You can feel as the lung of your body and the history of the place. Open your small mind to it, and you can hear the screams, the feudal sacrifices, 
and you can smell the hot blood on the cold stones like, damn, Rasputin is terrible. Eight centuries ago, mortals looked to the power to free the beast, but that power exists here and now in me. <laughs> um, Sounds like somebody else just freed the beast. <laughs> Yeah, the Braves are beating uh, the freaking uh, Cincinnati, uh, Cleveland. Sorry, they're beating Cleveland five of one. Um, yeah, he just goes right through the water, and then Rasputin's just there. Look around, <laughs> fear and wonder. Um, he does talk a whole lot in this third book. Yeah. I mean, he he does he gives the whole spill. He doesn't hold anything back for Hellboy. Um, he tells him, you know, yeah, I brought you here to stand beside me at Ragnarok, and the power I shall unleash. <laughs> Hellboy, he's going on. Yo, know, here's your destiny. Hellboy's like, do tell. I think I'll pass. <laughs> what? Can I get cream and sugar with that? Uh, you do not fully understand. I do not offer by by these words. I command. Yeah, I don't think so. And he loads up his gun. What do you call it? Big birth in the movies? I think so. Yeah. And he just unloads on his head. Uh, yeah. George of Liberty said I was the worst shot he'd ever tried to train. But I know when I've hit something. <laughs> That's uh, why the gun's so big. <laughs> exactly. So he can try and hit something. Um, okay, is is it me or does Rasputin look a lot like Bill the Cat in that bottom panel? Bill the Cat. Hack! <laughs> Something, yeah. As he sees, and he says, I do love the little funny symbols and everything that are, you know, spells or whatever. Yeah. Um, and he comes, but he puts his head back together um, as he, you know, of course, knocks Hellboy in there. And then this is him thinking again. After 40 years, he's got all of these trinkets to protect him from any kind of evil and everything else. And he says, either he's managed to nullify them, or he's so powerful, he doesn't care. <laughs> either way is bad. A little from column A, a little from column B. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you are not the first who has tried to destroy me. Uh, 80 years ago in another in, in my mother place of Russia. This is where we finally discover really he's Rasputin. The Prince Yuvish, I was poisoned, shot, and hurled into the frozen Neva uh, or Neva. But in those icy waters, the serpent called to me. So that's why he was saved. When he actually hit the waters, he heard the serpent and it helped him, you know, come back out. Uh, uh, and he, he's talking about bringing the damn serpent back and destroying the world. And Hellboy's like, yeah, so you're going to offer me what? A chance to be a junior partner in this little, uh, in this little fun fest. Thanks. But I have other plans for the apocalypse. Yeah, really? Yeah. Ooh. Um, I didn't catch this part when I first read it years ago, but the snake or not the snake, it's frog guy, whatever frog snake guy, the demon was actually originally seven uh seven Olsons. You know, he was the guy that like owned the house and was doing ex expeditions and stuff. He's actually been turned into this damn monster. Um and of course, you know, him and Hellboy get in this massive fight. And Abe is like just dude doing whatever Abe does underneath the freaking castle. Um, he finally finds, you know, some more of the monsters. Um, uh, this is kind of freaky too. And if God chose, I shall but love thee better after death. No, that's, that's, I think there's, it's, there's a law against that. Um, and <laughs> here, here, here I found the culprits. But he's finally stiff. <laughs> Damn it, this play... This place is of death is not inter entirely without life. Um, the monsters are eating on that lady, Mrs. Cavendish, from up top. And they, they just take her in the water. Uh, and then he's, uh, I sense a kind of kinship with the strange amphibians. Fearful to take my eyes from the water, I, I probe behind me with an outstretched hand. Rotten wood to reveal itself weak, 
Uh, and he just escapes. He keeps looking until he finds El Du Cavendish while Hellboy is literally getting the hell beat out of him. <laughs> By this damn big ass frog monster. Another one. Yes. <laughs> he, he, he says, he says, I hope he realizes he doesn't realize how close he is to winning this thing. And he's running on in, uh, adrenaline. And then he just, they dive in the water. He says, uh, <laughs> he doesn't have a clear idea how close he is to winning. And Hellboy gets his ass thrown out of the water and then pounded into the wall. He says, maybe some hope here. <laughs> Enough, Olsen. We do not want the creature dead. Um, and now Rasputin just spills the whole thing. Of course, Hellboy can't do anything but listen. So, you know, he's ranting about, you know, his death in Russia. He goes to Italy. You know, there he starts teaching. Um, he's offering, you know, help to priests and whatever else. And Himmler eventually comes to him to hire him. Um, and, of course, he takes him back to meet Hitler. And they, you know, give him everything to try and create their ultimate weapon to help them win the war. Um, that's when they go to the island where they actually summon Hellboy. And Hellboy's supposed to help bring about the end of the earth, but he doesn't. Um, and then um, <clears throat> when uh, the U.S. military shows up, Professor Bloom saves Hellboy and they defeat Rasputin. He talks about they just head to the North, uh, the North Arctic Waste. Um, I got this too. So. He takes people and get, you know promises them money, but then feeds on their souls as he's going, and just leaves the desiccated corpses there until he finally arrives, you know, in the temple in the Arctic by himself. Yeah, hidden from the world of here, hidden from the eyes of God, dead and fossilized to another. I would have seen the grotesque statue, but not me. Um. And then this is where uh, Professor Bloom actually shows up because um, he's doing more more work in Antarctic and he runs into uh, Rasputin in the temple up there. We see the names of the seven beasts or monsters. Dude, Liz does almost nothing in this book. Yep. I had forgotten that. Nothing. Dude, she's, she's actually unconscious. And, you know, now she finally enters. There's Rasputin, who brings her in there. And he's going to. He's basically her. like the human torch in the. Uh, in that bad movie from the 90s that. Uh, what's his name did? Corman. Yeah, the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie. Yeah. Torch shows up once, flames on once. Then we find out all they did was steal the animation from Fletcher Superman. Oh, damn it. Um, so he's got her and now he's, he's got her under mind control and he says, you know, her power just needs to be released to let it live a little. Um, and, uh, as he's doing that, the freaking demon shows up or the monster, uh, side helm, much improved from his condition. He is dying well on the flesh of men in every port from here to the Arctic circle. He has sucked the life from the waters of this ancient lake. He has grown strong. You think? Yeah. He's damn dude. He's 50 feet tall. That is cool. The Kirby crackle. Nobody does it anymore. It's cool to see it. Uh, <laughs> I offer you one last chance to join me of your own free will. To taste the power undreamed that sleeps within you and to feel for your purpose. He's just like, go to hell. No need, creature. Hell is coming here. Um, hey, yo, so with unshakable character, I'm in serious trouble and I need help. I wonder where Abe is. And we see Abe is like unconscious. At, I don't know if it's the body or like a painting of Cavendish. Did you ever figure that part out? Um, has the uh, 
has the has the butler transformed at this point? Is that the one that was fighting Hellboy? Yes. Okay, so it's gonna it's gonna be it must be a painting. Yeah, that's like what I was thinking. Underground. Some kind of painting or something, but Abe is just laying in front of it. Um and then there's Cavendish with his spear gun. Um, of course, now, he, you know, this is our fourth Hellboy, really not appearance, but kind of appearance. So he goes over it again. You know, I'm Hellboy. I'm, you know, I'm fighting Rasputin, demon, you know, controller of demons and Liz, my love. Uh, <laughs> in multitudes, my own power is linked to both Shadam and I will admit him, go into the eternal void in the abyss to smite him. Um, he just keeps telling him how, you know, he's going to get him. And finally, the monsters all attack Hellboy. And a damn light comes out of the castle. Um, kind of as the, as the creatures come. They're trying to bring them all from the different dimensions. Um, you know, Hellboy's doing all he can. But he's pretty much beat up. And he finds a concussion grenade from like six years ago. And he manages to shove it into the guy's, the frog guy's mouth, and it blows his damn head off. The, the frog creature is really cool. It's almost yeah. like he's got teeth and everything else. The butler. Oh, knowing uh, mercy on all. So here's all the, like, megaliths that were on the island that are showing. Okay. Did you catch this? These are the same people as Abe. But they're in another dimension. Yep. Yep. Their faces seem flatter. Do what? Their faces seem flatter. Seem flatter? Yeah. Flatter. Okay. So, yeah. He, uh, they're in like another dimension and they see... Rasputin opening the dimension portals to bring all the monsters in. He's like, um, the seven will smash their their world to cinders. And then when that's done, they'll spread their evil over all other known dimensions. Only one power can stop them. What imprisoned them? The power that created them. Um, but well, where is that power? It's not Hellboy. <laughs> He's having the hell beat out of him. Um, of course, Rasputin is still finishing his spell to bring forth the creatures when Abe shoots him with a damn spear, a harpoon. Hey, but he's not alone. He sees like the ghost of, uh, of uh, Cavendish behind him and the shadows, you know, just got to speak. A uh, freaking Liz goes crazy. Flame on. Dude, flame on. Flame <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> It's like in the Hellboy movie where she sets that damn house on fire. Yeah. Um, she just has no control. And she's not even awake. Uh, I do like Abe at the end. He's like, this is a mess. You'll have to let me read your report on this one, Hellboy. Assuming we get out so you can write it. He's like, deal. <laughs> yeah, the damn fire castle's coming down. You know, it's crushing the monster. Um. And, uh, of course, Hellboy runs past one of the damn, uh, like, Aztec statues. He says, hey, Steps, go on up. I don't think I'm done here. And, of course, he's not. As Rasputin attacks him out of the fire, he's, I'm still your master, boy. It's past time I destroyed you. And he's freaking breathing fire at him now. Um, I do like Hellboy and him get into this massive fight through here. Um, and he, he intentionally, when like the skull of Rasputin tells him, he says, you know, you'll crawl before me. Hellboy makes sure he picks it up and crushes the skull. It's done. You're not going to be doing that anymore. And the house is brought down. And then there's, I guess, that's got to be a painting of Cavendish. Yeah, I don't remember too much, Hellboy. I was <laughs> looking through the statues of old Ela Cavendish. And there was a harpoon stuck in, uh, sticking through the guy. 
and there was a really big monster. Imagine my confusion. Yeah. That's what it was. It was a statue that had the harpoon gun in its hand. In it? Okay. Sounds to me like old man Cavendish took over your body, eh? He was the one who did the harpooning. Yes, your Ragnarok killed the last of Ehu's family, an old family with a lot of pain, enough to allow him to reach from beyond the grave to extract his vengeance. Maybe he was just pissed because somebody else uh, found that uh, thing up in his uh, in the Arctic before his people did. They spent a long time looking for it. Uh, things would have been any different if they had found him. And of course, Liz doesn't remember crap, dude. Her brain is frozen. And Hellboy doesn't tell him that Rasputin says if he kills him, you know, he'll never understand his, you know, his true intentions. Yeah, I'll see you crawl before me. And of course, I, we he does leave us. Magnolia and, and Byrne leave us with a like a link that they are other Nazis, essentially wizards yeah. that are frozen somewhere else. Um, and they start to wake up. There, so it was too much like a fish fry to him. <laughs> Do yeah, they want to get out of there just like a fish fry. I enjoyed it. I haven't read it in years. Um, yeah, it was either. really good. Um, I don't know if it's the best Hellboy story. I know it's it's really important, but I mean, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if some of the other ones are better. This one in Wake the Devil were uh, the, f the first and second story of the ongoing so miniseries. Wake, Wake the Devil was the second one? Wake the Devil was the second one. And uh, those two basically set the groundwork for the Hellboy universe. Yeah. Set up like all the lore and everything, so. Which is fine. I mean, it's been it has been filled in, filled in over years. Um, it's amazing. Oh. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Now for something completely different. I I got. Where was it? Last week I showed you the um, collection of horror comics, the history of horror comics. Yeah. And there was one in there that I looked at that I had never really read. And it's not, it's a horror comic, but it's yeah. also not. So I was like, hey, let's try this. Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love. Have you seen how much these damn things go for on eBay? I kind of stay off of eBay. Stupid. Because I refuse, to use, I refuse to use PayPal. But yeah, I know the old horror stuff went from being like in 50 cent bins to being wall books. Yes. Yeah. Like a good copy of this is 50 bucks. Yeah. I'm like, when the F did that happen? Yeah. Also, when did we get old? <laughs> when did we get old? Um, the, I can't remember the writer, but the artist is um, Tony Dezunga. So right. I, was like, I was like, cool. Um, but yeah, it's in that book, and they're like, "This was a this was a super important series." So I'm like, "Let's read one," because I have never read anything, you know, not no Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love. This is not something I would have picked up as a teenager. <laughs> I might have flipped through it as a teenager and put it back, and then when I realized, no, nah, it's not like Skinamax, I would have I would have left it there and picked up my you know my usual copy of you know, Batman or uh, Superboy in the Legion or Spider-Man. Whatever. Yeah. The Secret of the Missing Bride. What was the meaning of Bettina's last phone call? In a house of sinister secrets, Laura Chandler seeks the shocking truth. A full-length novel of love and danger complete in this issue. <laughs> Number it's one. The first, it's the first issue. Yeah, 25 cents. It's got a cool cover too. It, it's got that. Uh, it's got that uh, dark shadows feel. Yeah, the seventies dark shadows feel. Yeah. Yeah. But all right, man. Well, I'll get that <coughs> and we will 
we'll get back to it next week. Sounds like a plan, Stan. Everybody, thanks for uh, joining us and hanging out. And uh, those that <clears throat> watched or listened afterwards on audio or video podcast, thank you so much. And we'll catch you next week with the Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love. Okay, I'm out of it. Uh, and I've got a special guest of uh, Doc Blaylock uh, next week on Creators Outlet. Uh, the second part of a story he's been working on. Well, he's, he's doing three different books, but uh, this is uh, the book of his that I bought last year. I apparently make an appearance in issue two. Oh, Lord. I happen to be in a gentleman club <laughs> in a bar fight. I can't imagine why. 